thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jennifer and Oliver, for bringing me out from Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm here to talk about why these men in these funny hats keep walking in circles. Oh, no, just kidding. OK, so one second, please. OK, it's getting oriented. So first off, um, I'm going to be giving away a book for anybody who knows how to use Twitter and is good at taking pictures and tweeting ridiculous tweets. And just tweet them at either Jamie R. Levy and pound generate conf. And then I'll count them at the end. And if they're especially funny, um, I'll come find you and give you a copy of my book, UX Strategy. But it's a fun way for us to crowdsource for the photos. Anyway, so feel free for that if you want a book. If you want to sell it on eBay, I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> so, OK. We all know what user experience design is. We know that it's an umbrella term for a lot of different disciplines. It includes all kinds of different activities, from everything from information architecture, interaction design, user research, visual design, and brings in so many different people with different backgrounds, which makes it exciting. We have people who are right brain, left brain, or like myself, can use both sides of their brain. I'm out of the extras. So when, after doing interface design and then information architecture and interaction design for so long, I got kind of bored with it. You know, I'd been doing software design for, for at least 20 years at this point. And I wanted to learn about something I heard called UX strategy. I wasn't sure what it was. So I bought this book called Mental Models by Andy Young. And it was at that time an advanced level UX book. And in it, it had a sidebar. And the sidebar said, UX strategy plus business strategy equals experience strategy. And I couldn't quite figure out this formula. So I tried to use deduction. And I took out the word strategy and said, well, does UX plus business equal experience? I don't know. Hmm. Because I was thinking. Maybe UX plus LSD equals experience. <laughs> so I kept looking and trying to find more articles about it. I searched Google once again, confronted with more Venn diagrams and frameworks trying to explain what the hell UX strategy is. And at this point, I was getting frustrated because I was working on discovery phases, as they called them. Um, where you would work before you went into actual design, development, the UX phase. And you'd have maybe a week to sit with the stakeholders, gather requirements, uh, do some consensus building exercises, um, maybe uh, create some personas. And it just didn't seem very empirical. It just seemed like we were kind of just like phoning it in, as they call it in the States. So I was pretty frustrated. So I decided I was going to come up with my own definition and framework. That this was something I really wanted to understand and was extremely interested in. And so what the hell is UX strategy? Well, first of all, I think it, it's like the filming that you get when you're at the top of a waterfall. This is Niagara Falls. And you're at the top. And you're about to go over the edge. And that edge for us is the world of product development, the point of no return, where you're already making something. Sure, maybe you're using Agile or Lean or think you are. And <laughs> but at the very end, you've run out of your resources, your time, your, the different people working on it. And you pretty much, that was your shot. So I wanted to come up with a 
way that we can apply some concepts from Lean and from Agile to the strategy phase. So the first thing was I had to redefine it. And the simple definition would be user experience strategy lies at the intersection of UX design and business strategy. But it's more than that. It's also that it's a plan of action on how to ascertain that the experience of a product is aligned with the business objectives. That we're not just wireframe monkeys or product directors or engineers sitting behind our computers doing just what we think our job is, but that we actually understand the overall vision of the company that we work for and the part that we're playing in it adds up to what their overall objective is. More than that, it's a method, UX strategy. It's a method by which you can validate that your solution solves a problem for real customers in a dynamic marketplace. Not just hypothesized customers that we've guessed at, that we think are their customers, or maybe our boss, or the entrepreneur, the founder, the stakeholders are like, oh, this idea is the idea. It's great. And you might ask, why do you think it's great? It's like, well, I would use it thus. Everybody would use it. Go make it. This isn't OK. So to me, when I have to deal with these people, which is often, I'm always trying to have them think about having an experimental mindset and that we don't really know for sure that what their vision is is what customers want and will pay for or that we can monetize at the end of the, at the, end of the day. And that we want to make sure that whatever we're making, because we're putting our life into this piece of software or the service design initiative, that we, it actually solves a problem. And then what makes it even more complex is that the marketplace is constantly changing. That's what's exciting about what we do. It's, we're constantly getting inundated by new technologies. You know, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, all of these things that were kind of make-believe when I started out in the late 80s are now all of a sudden being developed and we're starting to see in practical applications. And these are opportunities. And so they're also threats because we're making something and then all of a sudden the whole world changes because there's this new technology that can do something special. So. The most important thing about UX strategy is that it's a practice, not one that's subjective, not one where it's like, oh, I like this one better than that one because I think purple looks better than orange. That's bullshit. That we approach our strategy and our design in an empirical way, like a science experiment. Because if we do it that way and we're constantly testing our concepts on our hypothesized customers, we have a way better guarantee of success with our digital product than just crossing our fingers, knocking out a bunch of wires, and writing a bunch of code. So I came up with this framework, because we all have to have frameworks, right, I guess. And this one, instead of showing it like a Venn diagram, because I'm a foodie, I show it like plates on a table. And these are my four tenets that if we're going to conduct product strategy techniques, that they need to have aspects of all these different tenants, and <clears throat> that we look at them as like, if we're going out for tapas and their plates, and that we're sharing them with our teams, and we're going to eat off a little bit of each plate. These plates, business strategy, value innovation, validated user research, and killer UX design. So. Let me explain them real quickly. So business strategy is the plans, choices, and decisions used to guide a company to greater profitability and success. This is at a higher level than just our user experience strategy or discovery phase. This is the actual business goals, why the business exists. And we need to know, regardless if we're working for a startup, an agency, or an enterprise, 
what is important to them? What is their overall vision? Because if we just sit behind our computers, just doing our job, working in silos, then we're not being part of the big picture, unless you're satisfied with just doing that little job. But if you actually want to grow with that company and climb that corporate ladder, you need to really understand what business you are in. So there's this book from 1985 written by Michael Porter, one of the, these many Harvard Business School professors. And he wrote this book called Competitive Advantage. And he laid out two common ways to achieve a, a competitive advantage. The first one is cost leadership. This one's like a race to the bottom if you think about McDonald's. Who can make the cheapest hamburger, even if it's out of dog meat, that people can buy easily, efficiently, and of course there's crazy competition against all these different fast food chains. But the idea here is that you're trying to offer the lowest price to capture the largest customer base. So that's one of the ways. But if we think about this strategy as product developers, product designers, it's a little bit challenging because a lot of the applications, platforms, apps that we use are free. Or maybe we're downloading an app for 99 cents that we'll never use again. You know? I mean, how much do you pay for Google Maps, Oliver? Nothing? Wow, you lucky dog. It's free. Like so many of the tool of the apps that we use, we're not spending any money on. So how do we compete with free? So there's this other opportunity, which is differentiation. This is by making a product that's unique, that offers something that the other products and services don't. It's not about competing on cost, it's competing on differentiation. So the brick and mortar example would be Starbucks. When Starbucks started, it was actually just a little store in Seattle selling roasted beans. But the CEO, Howard Schultz, saw an opportunity. He saw that in America, people were just drinking instant coffee or going to McDonald's or like me running into a bodega in New York and off to school just to have my caffeine boost. That's all the coffee meant to me. And I would pay 50 cents for it or a dollar at the time. But he goes to Milan, orders a latte. They take his name. He hears all the and the smell of the fresh coffee. They're playing music. He gets this beautiful latte back. It's got like all the little smoothy, frothy stuff at the top. And it tastes incredible. He sits down, he hangs out at this cafe for hours, and he realized this is an experience. I wonder if I brought this experience back to America, they would adopt it. So he tried that, and he brought it back. And at first, the CEOs of Starbucks were like, no way, we're not doing this. We just sell beans. So he started his own company, which they ultimately bought because it was immediately successful. He proved that people were completely happy to pay $5 for a crap of frappuccino to drink it and have this differentiated experience. And as product makers, this is what we have to think about so that we can create something that might cost nothing or might cost a little bit more, but no matter what, if we just keep making replicas of what already exists, we're not gonna win. So what we're talking about ultimately is a value proposition. A value proposition is a promise of value to be delivered and the belief from the customer that the value will be experienced. What you're looking at is first the Newton. I don't know how many of you are old enough to have owned a Newton. I certainly bought one. I wanted to be the chick that could sit in Central Park, take out this device, and be able to send an email instead of sitting at my desktop computer in an office. Sounded like an amazing value proposition. 
it said that the handwriting recognition was its biggest feature. And this was an issue because I'm left-handed. And so I wanted to test this thing. I paid $800 for that with inflation. is now $1,600. And took the thing out, connected all the modems and the keyboards, and it was out of control. And tried to send an email, and it didn't really work. I tried it a bunch of times, and ultimately, I just threw the thing into my second drawer in the file cabinet and never pulled it out again. It did not deliver on its value proposition. But Apple learned. Other PDAs came out. And ultimately, they developed something that has delivered on its value proposition, the iPhone. Many of us own iPhones, so I don't need to go and glamorize them. But what makes them so special to me is that they do so much more than allow us to make a phone call. They allowed me to take an Uber here this morning quite quickly. City Map allows me to get around London when I'm not sure which train to take. I can text my son all kinds of silly little videos. It's a computer in my back pocket and keeps me connected to the world. And when I lose it, which I do at least every few months, I'm devastated. I'm truly addicted to this product. So this is an example of a really tantalizing value proposition. So we have a value proposition. And then what? Our stakeholders have come up to us with a vision. Or maybe they've given us a creative brief. Maybe it's our idea and we're trying to raise funding. But how do we know that our idea is original? How do we know that our idea hasn't been done? We have to conduct traditional business strategy techniques. This is where I feel like lean startup and design thinking fall short. It's fine if you want to sit around in a room with glass windows and put sticky notes on the wall and come up with your solutions. But how do you know that any of these? haven't already been tried and failed. Or it's fine to sit in a room and create MVP and pivot around left and right, but how do you know at the very end that your solution hasn't already been tried and failed? The way to know is to look at the marketplace, to do competitive research. And so I created a toolkit. It's free. You can go to userexperiencestrategy.com and download it. And it basically has rows for all the competitors. My book teaches you how to find them if you don't know how. And you go through them and look at everything, not just doing market research, but looking at how, like, how are they leveraging social network? How easy is it to create the most primary task? How, I mean, complete the primary task. When was the company founded? How much funding did they raise? How many followers did they have on Twitter? All these different attributes that ultimately can add up to whether the company is going to be successful or not. And we can look at them and triangulate some of this data and say, these guys are our biggest threat. Are they killing it in the user experience area? Is that our opportunity to win? Because we don't have so much funding. Are they killing it with social media? We have to look at these attributes and really understand if there's opportunity for us before we go over the edge of the waterfall and waste our lives and a bunch of money. Not looking at the competition is like being the mythical ostrich that just goes, eh, I don't want to know. I'm sure my idea is great. It's awesome. I don't want to look at the other, you know. It was probably like that band Interpol, like, no, don't play me Joy Division. We're going to do our own thing. <laughs> We're original. Um, so we don't want to be like that. We want to know what's out there. We don't want to take this risk. We want to de-risk our value proposition to make sure that we are making something that's potentially unique and will deliver value. So this brings us to value innovation, which can be accomplished by focusing on the primary utility of a product so that it's an indispensable part of our life. I stole this term from this book, Blue Ocean Strategy. This came out in 2005. And it's called Blue Ocean Strategy because it's this idea that we come up with a product or service and we want to swim out into a blue ocean. 
where there's an uncontested marketplace, where there's opportunity, as opposed to a red ocean full of sharks that are making the same exact thing, biting at our feet, and the water's totally bloody. Who wants to compete in that marketplace? Not me. So one of the things that they talked about was this value innovation. That's where I got the idea. And it's taking Michael Porter's concepts to the next level, where you have the simultaneous pursuit of low cost and the value going up to this diamond in the middle. So if we think about it like in terms of a company like Airbnb, if you've stayed in an Airbnb, you might stay in one because it's cheaper than a hotel and it's in a neighborhood that's less touristy and you get to have a kitchen and you get to spread out and you get to feel like a local. That's value innovation and that's why they're so successful. So let's talk about digital value innovation for a second. Digital value innovation offers new mental models. A mental model, getting back to Indy Young's book, is this idea that we just, it, it, it sounds like a complicated term, but all it really means is how a person thinks in their head what it takes to accomplish a task. And innovation can happen when we reimagine an offline experience with a digital interface. For example, hitchhiking. Hitchhiking is a pretty creepy endeavor for especially us women. How many girls in the room, women, hitchhike in London? Mm, I'm not seeing anybody. OK. I hope there's some girls in here. OK, so now we're presented with this interface called Uber. I just hitchhiked her. We click a button. We get to see how many cars are around us, how long it'll take for them to get there. And then all of a sudden, Grandpa shows up. He's actually a grandpa, I asked him, not being ageist. <clears throat> and I asked Grandpa, I, said, I mean, I asked this man, I said, why are you an Uber driver? Because obviously he's an elderly man who is retired. And he said, I love talking to strangers, and I, I don't mind having the pocket change. And so all of a sudden, we have people driving around in cars picking up strangers, and people who would never hitchhike, like myself, getting into strangers' cars, all because there's an interface in the middle. Our mental model of hitchhiking has changed. And sure, you can argue and say, oh, they've just replaced taxis. But not really, because they don't have a medallion. It's easy to pass a background check. We see that there's trust, just like how Amazon builds trust when we choose a book or a product to buy. And they've established a business process and great technology to create a winning company. By changing our mental model of what we think about getting in a stranger's car or letting a stranger get into our car. Validated user research is when we focus on research on a specific customer segment who have a problem that needs to be solved, and we validate it with measurable results. Not just doing research where we're going out there and trying to have empathy, but actually trying to understand our customer's problem. And if they really have it, if it's a migraine problem, not a headache problem. And so this idea of validated research was popularized by the lean startup with the build, measure, learn feedback loop. And I'm sure many of you saw it who have read Lean Startup. But if you apply this idea, which has been used for product development now for a while, to strategy, it works perfectly great. Our ideas are value proposition. We build as little of it as we can to express the concept. Maybe it's a prototype. That's our product. We show it to our customers. We measure whether you use it. Does it solve your problem? How much would you pay for it? We learn, and then we ideate. We keep going in circles until we fine tune it. And these two books had a big influence on it, About Face by Alan Cooper and The Four Steps to the Epiphany by Steve Blank. They took ideas of extending traditional user research where we go up and observe and spend a few months creating journals into this idea that we approach customer interviews and user research as an experiment, and that everything that we think in our head is just a guess that we have to prove right or wrong, and that we measure them, and we find out earlier on, 
do, the, with, do they want this app? How much are they willing to pay for it? Do we need to pivot on our business model? And so forth. And so we can create prototypes that we show to our customers of concepts to measure signal. Not to see, we're not testing usability, that's ridiculous. We're trying to see if actually our big ideas are something that they want. And put them in front of our hypothesized customer. In this case, it's at a cafe and we're showing a groom to be this concept of Airbnb for weddings to see if he would rent a stranger's house for his big day. And I also use it with my startup clients. I actually bring them to the table so they can actually hear from the customer's mouth why they're not using his web platform. Because he thought when he hired me it was because the UX design sucked. And I said, I don't know, I'm kind of concerned about your business model. Let's talk to 10 people that have been to, in this case, treatment centers for drugs and find out if they would use it and why not. And he learned more in that one day than the entire one year of failure. He tracked it in a spreadsheet. And I also do Facebook advertising, just fake ads with value props and send them sometimes to landing pages trying to collect emails. I can interview them if I get them. But being able to A, B test all kinds of different ideas on the value prop without spending large amounts of money. Killer UX design is basically frictionless design. Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think, he calls it that because if we have to make our customers or users think when they're trying to use our product, then we failed. They should be able to do it intuitively, frictionlessly. Just like they use, when they use Airbnb, it's as easy as pie. When I use Waze, killer UX design, it offers me routes that's so much better than Google Maps. It tells me when there's a little cop on the road that might see my phone out and offers me the best routes, shortcutting the freeway, better than Google Maps. For Tinder, instead of having to read a bunch of bogus profiles about guys saying they read books they've never even read, I can just swipe right. If they swipe right, we can set up a date and see if there's chemistry. Hopefully, they won't rate me. And it's a great concept. The interaction model of swiping has been all of a sudden taken everywhere. And then my favorite is Periscope, now Twitter Live. This idea, like last night when I was at my favorite venue, Cafe Odo in Dalston, seeing a band that I could just all of a sudden say, I'm going to record this band live and tweet it out. And I'm like CNN, MTV Live, broadcasting all this weird experimental music that's just zooming out there on the internet. And I'm watching people watch my live signal. That's killer user experience. And it's ultimately about sending people down the funnel so that they're either addicted customers who use it often that we can monetize or happy customers. Killer UX design equals better engagement and conversion. It's not about site maps. It's not about wireframes. It's about getting people down our funnel so that they complete their task. So let me give you the case study of Hyperloop and how that happened. About a year ago, I was at a pub in Hollywood. We have pubs in LA, believe it or not. And I was hanging out with my good friend Zon. Now Zon's one of these like genius types. He's British, of course. Went to Cambridge, and then MIT. He's worked his way down the ladder. And then I met him when he was at the University of Southern California. And he was studying transmedia and, and future forecasting, scenario design. He's just like this really, really brilliant man. And he's my go-to guy when I feel like I've hit a wall in my career. And so we were hanging out of the pub, and I was complaining to Zon about my poor, sad life of being this author with this book that's doing really well. And how I'd you know, written this book, I'd explained a framework of UX strategy, and that people were liking it, and that it had all these techniques that people were all of a sudden conducting. And I was getting invited to speak all over the world, getting to go to countries that I've never been to before, and meet amazing product makers who gave me their perspective on UX design and strategy. 
And I was also, it was the course textbook because I teach. I'm a professor at the University of Southern California in the engineering school. And so I was complaining to Zahn about my life that I felt like I was like her. I was a poser. I was this person who was running around the world, who was preaching and teaching, evangelizing and writing, but I wasn't actually making anything anymore. It been, had been years since I had actually made anything. Here I'd written this book called How to Devise Innovative Digital Products, and I wasn't doing anything innovative. So Zahn said to me, well, Jamie, who are the innovators who inspired you? And I said, well, that's easy. Andy Warhol. I loved Andy Warhol when I was in college. He was so amazing. He brought pop art to the masses. He made what became fine art totally accessible to people who never really got art. He also made crazy experimental movies, ones that were so unwatchable that people either ran out of the movie theater because they were too long or because they were too offensive. He had his factory where he had incredible bands like the Velvet Underground play. And all of these different people would come, artists and writers, and hang out and party. And then they would go on and make art and write and do inspiring things. And Suzanne said, well, how about somebody in tech? And I said, OK, how about Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs, rest in peace, has done so many innovative things. I mean, obviously, it's not just him. His company, Apple, Steve Wozniak, Johnny Ive, all, all, there's a lot of people involved. But ultimately, he's the big idea guy that comes up with these crazy ideas about shuffling and tapping on glass and Apple TV and my first computer, the one at the bottom middle, and now the iPhone. But they're all connected together. It's not just that they're separate devices, but that through the App Store and iTunes, we're able to watch movies and download books and do so many different things. And if we have a problem, we just go to the Apple Store and the Genius Bar sorts us out. You can't say that about the PC. He's created an entire ecosystem of innovative products, and hopefully we shall see if they continue that without him there. But the reason Apple has been so successful is that they always stay ahead, at least two years ahead of the competition, which for hardware is crucial because it takes so long to catch up. So John said, well, are there any living animators who inspire you? And I had to think about that. And I was like, well, he said, what about ones that don't wear black turtlenecks? <laughs> I was like, crap. <laughs> so I was like, Ugh, I can't wear my black turtleneck anymore? Fine. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. As I said, I'm a poser. And I like to dress like my heroes. So Elon Musk is amazing. Since his early days, when he was a teenager, he created video games. He created the first web-based phone calls, which we now think of as Skype. He co-founded PayPal. He invested huge amounts of money in companies like SolarCity, Tesla, and then, of course, put a million bucks of his own dough into SpaceX. This is a seriously innovative guy. And Zahn was like, you should try to figure out a way to get involved in one of his projects. And he's got this new one that's called Hyperloop. And Hyperloop is one where it's this idea that you can get into this high-speed transit system and be jetted, let's say, from Los Angeles to San Francisco for 25 bucks in 30 minutes and get there. It's like magic. And I was like, wow, that sounds rad. And he put it out as open source. And the idea with open source is that he wanted other people to contribute to his idea, his kind of back of the napkin idea. And open source is this idea where people can look at the code and 
basically take it to the next level. It's like skateboarding to me, where you see someone do a trick and you're like, oh, let me try that. Let me do some in a different way. And people build on things in a collaborative fashion that ultimately helps the community move forward as a unit. So I saw that there were two companies doing Hyperloop in Los Angeles. One of them was called Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and this other one called Hyperloop One. And I thought the one Hyperloop Transportation Technology was interesting because their business model was based on crowdsourcing. And so I reached out to the CEO because I saw him all over the news and he kept saying user experience, user experience, user experience. And I was like, oh, this guy gets it. This is going to be cool. So I decided I would stalk him. And I found him on LinkedIn and I wrote him a letter and I said, hey, Dirk. I wrote this book. I'll give you a free copy. Um, and by the way, are you interested in a user experience consultant? Because I would love to work on your concept. And he wrote me back 17 seconds later and said, sure. Everybody on the team is working in exchange for stock options. You just have to work a minimum of 10 hours a week. Just contact this guy, Michael. And I was like, ah, oh, stock options. <laughs> this is not going to pay the rent. So I decided I needed to further crowdsource this concept to my students at USC. So I sent out over Blackboard a notice, hey, anybody who wants to get onto the Hyperloop projects, volunteer. And I got 20 volunteers for five different projects. And this is what we wanted to solve. This is the big picture. Traffic in LA sucks. Traffic in most major cities sucks. Even trying to transport ourselves all over the world sucks. It's really complicated just trying to book all the different modes of transportation, like for me to get from LA from the Ubers to New York, excuse me, LA, the airport to here, and then Heathrow Express to the tube to this to that. It's so many different things, and I had to go to so many different sites and apps to make it all happen. So he had a bunch of different concepts, and we spun with them. And we used my UX strategy methodology. First, we stated it as a problem statement. In this case, business commuters and pleasure travelers are challenged to find a cost and time efficient end-to-end -end solution to go places. I had them create validated, uh, create personas and go out and talk to people that fit this persona and validate that this truly was a problem that needed to be solved. They went out and did customer discovery at a mall where they were able to find these types of people and came back with findings, validated this, this problem, and then looked at the marketplace to see who else was solving it, this sort of end-to-end -end transportation, and then did their findings brief and started creating screens for a prototype. We had another idea. That was a ride-sharing app. So this was one where we were trying to solve the problem for drivers of transportation systems who have a hard time knowing when they could, is the best time to actually like be in the right place to always be able to have somebody who needs a ride. Because they don't know when the surges happen in most cases. And right now it's kind of limited to Ubers. So we went out and did, they went out and did interviews. They talked to Uber drivers because they're typically trapped. And found out, yes, it is a problem. They don't have any insight when passengers need to be picked up ahead of time, did the competitive research, and then created a prototype where you could sign in, choose what method of car uh, transportation. It could be a car, a bus, a boat, a, a rickshaw, whatever, and then pick up a bunch of passengers, see a surge at LAX, and then take them to their destination. And we went and showed this to all kinds of different riders of different transportation vehicles to see if they thought this would be cool. Concept three, advertising. Think about advertising to somebody who's constantly moving through time and space. Waze has come the closest to us where they pop up ads while you're driving and kind of block your map. So here we have people who are moving through different modes of transportation and we want to run ads at them. 
and we know who are placing these ads, and we validate that they have a problem running uh, GPS-based ads, and validated it was a major problem. And we looked at the competitors who was attempting to do that, and there was nothing even close. There's these kinds of innovation, like bikes that you could ride for free and they would just blast ads at people. But ultimately, we were trying to figure out what would it look like, what would the experience be for someone who is trying to place an ad and say, I'm gonna run it at this guy going between this city and this city, and maybe they'll play a game, or maybe they'll watch a video and it'll subsidize their ride. Someone could actually use Uber and get a free ride. Concept four was thinking about the stakeholder, the people who were running, driving the trains or managing the trains, managing the bus system, managing the plane systems, because they don't share data, and all this data is out there. Why is it that we show up to the darn airport and they don't put us on another plane if ours is canceled? You know, because it's run by a different airline. Greedy. So we interviewed train managers and tried to figure out what it is about them that we would make their job easier, what were the problems, looked at the different legacy systems out there and created a prototype that could look at how we could potentially optimize trains and buses and the Ubers and the Tuk Tuks and the boats so that everybody kind of was aware when different, when different systems were coming together so that we could make the entire experience seamless. And then lastly, was the onboard entertainment system. We've all seen them on the back of the seat of planes. Maybe we get to connect our USB drive in there. And we know that if we're business travelers like myself, it's pretty you know, clunky to pull out your laptop and try to work. So we knew that was a problem. We looked at the best of, of all the different competitors out there and did a brief and then ultimately tried to create a system that was built into the back of the seat where you didn't have to whip out your laptop and you could just log in and ultimately access all your applications, all your games, all, anything that you wanted to do to communicate. And so this was a great experience for my class and for me to really experiment with innovation by looking ahead in the future so we could sort of think about mental models in new ways. So what are the takeaways? No matter where you are in your career path, you should always have both mentors and inspiring heroes. This has really helped me a lot. And I try to give back by mentoring others. Secondly, if you want to work on innovative products, you need to position yourself as a contributor. It's not about money. And then lastly, by applying a UX strategy methodology for futuristic concepts, even engineering students can attempt to transform the world for the common good. Thank you. Thanks for the interview. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to set up the next speaker and then we're going to crack on. Um, do you want to maybe answer questions? <laughs>